So, a role of an architect in a company. Um, could we have picked a broader subject? I don't know. Uh, it's, already, it's already a broad subject. Um, Sarah told you earlier there's a thousand of us in VP Tech. There's a thousand people in VP Tech, not in Privalia and the group. It's just people who work on software and building things, right? So I've been in the industry for 15 years, about 15 years, and I've been doing architecture for officially three or four of them, but I believe we've all been doing architecture from the get-go, right? I'd like to open up with a question. Um, do we have architects sitting here already? Raise your hand if you're an architect. You're, you're not an architect, Sarah. So. <laughs> um, so first of a question for the few architects who raised their hand. What was your um, feeling about architects when you were there? You, you all came from development, right? All the architects came from development. What was your feeling about architects when you were developing? Good or bad? I didn't know. Which is one of the main questions. Yeah. So the guys who are not architects, what are you doing? What, what's your job? What do you do every day? So what do you want to know about architecture? Do you want to become an architect? Is it something you want to do? Yeah? So Why? <laughs> may, may, uh, may I point out uh, my one point of view of mine? Uh, to me, to be an architect is just to, to be very interested about software architecture. It's not like uh, a, a degree, a military degree, you know? <laughs> Just was to point out this. Okay. This is my job. <laughs> yeah, really. Why do you want to be an architect? That's uh, a good question. So, just to get this going, right? Um, the big question, I mean, if you were here, you probably went on the internet at some point and typed, what is the role of an architect? Or architect job description, or day-to-day -day of an architect, or things like this. And if you read through them, you come up with a lot of answers, right? And they're all boring, and I don't know if that's really what you want to do. Um, someone said uh, ivory tower architect, right? Sorry. Someone said ivory tower architect. Personally, when I was a developer, I hated all the architects I ran across, all of them. Not one of them, right? So I didn't want to become an architect. That's not something I wanted in my career. It wasn't in the books at all. I just wanted to be a tech expert. I wanted to play around with software and tech. Um, so when VP Tech actually pushed me towards architecture, there was a lot of pushback from me. I didn't want to become an architect because I like doing stuff and I like participating in building stuff. So the first thing is, a good architect is not going to give this part up. That's, that's, that's not part of what I do, at, at least the way I do the job. And I think it's interesting that this is not a presentation but a round table because in my book at least, there is no definition of what is an architect correctly. There's a few check boxes that you can add there. Yes, technology, technology expert, yes, okay, okay. Can, do, can draw designs with boxes and arrows, yes, okay. Nobody understands it, yes, okay as well. Okay, yeah, there's a few check boxes in there, but there's no clear definition. And, I, I hope and, and this is not what it is to be an architect. No, but which one? Which part? Is everything and no of the... Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to confuse them even yeah. more. Is that, uh, of is course. That <laughs> and I think what David is hitting on is that um, there is no one answer, and it's actually interesting that... Um, how much of you? How, how much? Uh, how many people do you have in your in your company? Um, well, we are thirty-one. Um, I think some, something like twenty-five technician and uh, and the rest like marketing and so on and accountability and uh, accountancy. And uh, well, the there's our the our structure is is a little bit more fluid than the structure of Benfrivea, I suppose. 
because we are mm, our teams are um, are changing uh, based on the project we are we are doing in, in a moment in time. So my role is also continuously changing, and uh, I'm also a consultant. So um, well, I I will try to to find a way to explain what I do if you want. Is is it's about I have to focus to focus uh, mm, my time on the on the problematic part of, of the projects and on on the hard stuff. Um, I but say maybe trying that stuff not not going terribly wrong, basically, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, um, to focus means for me to have a method of of, of getting close to, to the core problems or the core issues or the core um, design decisions, strategic strategical decisions as well. And for me, that method is a, I call it Socratic method, is based upon questions, basically. <laughs> Making many questions, very silly question, uh, questions, and also questioning not only the team, but also the system. When I have problems, I have to study experiments to, to question the system. And But maybe this is because I have to optimize uh, my time in each team. OK. I don't know if <laughs> it was pertinent. You talked about system, and I think that's, that's a very important part of uh, your definition. Um, an architect is never going to do the same job depending on the size of the team and depending on the scope of what you're working on, right? Things are ever going to change, right? Um, a thousand people. You don't deal with a thousand. There's a thousand people and there's six, 16 architects. I think there's 16 of us inside of the whole company. 15, I think. 15? Did, did someone get fired? <laughs> is, it, is it me? Um, no, but joking aside, it's a huge company, there's a lot to do, and you don't interact with people on the same level when there's a, a thousand of you, uh, when there's a hundred of you, or when there's 50 of you. I'd even argue that when you go below 30, I don't know if having an architect actually makes sense, because depending on what you're doing, um, you're all supposed to be owner of the stack, right? The architect is not the owner of the stack. The developer is the owner of the stack. The architect just tries to make it work on a large scale, and scale, is an important factor on the system side as well. System can mean anything. When you're talking software, software is a system. It's, it's a lot of components that interact together. When you're talking a couple of software that actually give business one value, it's also a system. It's a system of multiple software, which are made of components. And when you're talking about a company, a company is also a system. It's multiple bricks that compose of software, compose of component, make things work. So you have these multiple degrees that you can look at things. Uh, you have the, the first level, which is basic software architecture, and then you have the very high level, which is when we start talking enterprise architecture, which is much higher level. Um, but at the end of the day, you're not the owner, you're just a facilitator as an architect. I, I don't feel like I'm the owner of what is actually being produced, which is frustrating. Coming from development, I'll, I'll be honest, it's very frustrating, especially when you're used to putting things into production and seeing things run and then talking to the users. It's Frustrating, taking the step back. It's very rewarding seeing the big picture work, right? We're all in this for the puzzle at some point. Uh, at least I'm in it for the puzzle. I don't know what, what you guys are in it for. And seeing it everything work together is very rewarding. But it takes a step. But for me, in the day-to-day -day work, uh, the, the real thing is I have to figure out my job every day Every day is different. I have uh, work for three people, just for myself. But I have to decide what is the most important thing in every moment. I have to work uh, with the developers to uh, set good practices, to help them to adopt the new technologies. Also, I have to test new technologies. I have to work with the product owners to define the, the technical roadmap of the products. I have to work with other architects to define guidelines or anything, I have to work with the IT lead in the whatever, <laughs> okay? And every day is different. Uh, the, 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 this is, uh, we don't have 
a clear backlog of everything, okay? Uh, yes, we have a backlog, a backlog of things to do, but it's not clear, and there is no one to prioritize your job. You have to figure out what do, do you have to do every day. This is, uh, I think this is very important, at least in a company with the size of ours. Uh, maybe in, in a small company is most clear what the architect does. It's worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the architect does everything in a small company, yeah. Um, that, that, that's the, the, the real thing. Uh, what is my job? Uh, it depends. <laughs> have to do everything since uh, see the code with the developer, uh, try to convince the, the SREs to uh, test new technology, uh, talk to the other architects about uh, the best way to communicate microservices or whatever, and everything at the same time, and uh, changing from day to day. He said, he said microservices, that's a forbidden word. He, he, said, he, he said microservices yeah. and that's a forbidden word. We don't say microservices anymore. I agree. <laughs> we're, not, we're not allowed to say it? Please, please don't. Let's not talk about Microsoft. Please. I you, totally if, you guys if you guys have questions, willing to answer any of them, but no, if I there's I microservices in the questions, I'm standing up and leaving. Okay? I, I think s s some architects from here can explain, like us, what yeah. they are doing. No? So I if I may interrupt uh, after this very quick uh, introduction. This is an event based on <laughs> collaboration, right? So we have these three wonderful people here uh, willing to uh, <laughs> You get the point, right? So we have, we have wonderful people here uh, willing to answer questions and willing to guide the discussion, but it's also up to us to seed the discussion with things, right? Otherwise, they're going to be talking about uh, why microservices are not cool and what, et cetera, right? So it's, it's, our, it's our duty to ask them good questions. So I, I, think, you, I think you had a question coming up. The question is, it's just a quick question. So the question is whether we have different types of architectures, uh, architecture roles, because I heard that there might be enterprise architecture roles, solution architect, and other kind of architects. So what kind of? architect you are, and do you think uh, we have multiple architecture roles? Uh, yeah, more or less. <laughs> now, I, I, in fact, yes, uh, the solution architect is more focused in the software solution, the enterprise architect is more focused in the functionality, in the boundaries of the products, uh, with the how everything works together, and so, but at some point, all the architects do more or less the same. The, the different thing is the where they put the focus in the day-to-day. -day. But uh, the architect has to be technician, has to be functional, has to be uh, everything, at least in my opinion, because uh, all people expect from you to do different roles, okay? The, the developers uh, uh, expect that you help them to do whatever, the uh, SRE is the same, the other architects uh, or the, uh, the product owners thinks you know all the system uh, in the company. So, uh, but uh, the enterprise architect has to be more focused in, in this, in have the, the, the boundaries, the functionality of everything, and so, and the solutions architect is more focused in the maybe in the technical part in how to uh, get the things done i mean okay if i don't have enough soft skills and i'm a technical guy i like to dig into complex systems so whether i do you think i have a chance to become an architect or i should uh, practice some soft skills and do more conversation conf attend conferences and share knowledge and what you kind you of skills should I have? Uh, you, you have to be, uh, you, you have to communicate to each other. <laughs> m m many people expect uh, this for from the architect. Yeah, well that's that's actually kind of a, of a tricky question because communication is very important. When you're an architect, like I said, you're not doing anything. 
And in reality, I'm not doing anything. Right? All I'm doing is helping people achieve their goals, which is nice on paper, but in reality, I'm not doing anything. The, the I might are just draw you my diagrams and send it by email, for instance. It would be wonderful design. Yeah, remember when I said the checkboxes? Does diagrams that no one understands? That I'm not kidding. Most of the diagrams you're going to do, no one is going to understand them if you're not sitting next to him explaining what it means. Because w it makes sense in our head, doesn't make sense to most of the POs who throw it at, for example. Okay. Software, soft right. skills and communication are two very different things. Right? Let's, I, 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 everyone loves this word, soft skills. Oh, he has great soft skills. You can be very transparent, very clear, and have garbage soft skills. Right? It doesn't, it, it doesn't link together. Be clear in what you're saying, be clear in how you say it. Um, know what you don't know, that's, that's one of the m key factors. It's when you don't know something, don't pretend that you do or don't try to, I think it's, be very clear, I don't know this, and say it like this, and you'll do fine, and you will do fine. Depending on how far you want to go, like enterprise architecture, you stop doing, I'm doing a lot of enterprise architecture today, right? And you, so you start seeing way less tech in everything you do every day. But from what you're saying, I don't think that's something you want to do. So I'm talking way more with a composition of applications. So I'm not digging deeper into the components. And I'm talking way more to the business and way more to the people who are going to do things, but in high level stuff. Like you're going to plug, I don't know, the order management system uh, to the checkout in this way. And it needs to communicate this information, but this piece of data does not, uh, cannot go to this system. It needs to stay there, and it stops there. I'm never going to talk about Kafka. I'm never going to talk about com containers. This, this, is not, this is where I'm going to stop. Now, if I'm going to start talking with the people who are going to implement this, then I'm going to take another hat, and then I'm going to start talking tech, because I'm talking to the tech people. But this job is more of David's focus today. David does a lot of tech stuff. I do a lot of enterprise architect stuff. So the question you asked earlier, well, yes, there's multiple hats. Um, I don't think you can go to the enterprise level without having gone at least to the software architecture and component level and so on. It's a, it's a matter of steps. Um, but then it's, a, it's what you want to do as well, right? I, I had a lot of problem letting go of a lot of the tech things and putting things into production. That was a real problem for me at the start. But I felt uh, I feel, com feel comfortable with it now because I got an, uh, uh, other things out of it. OK. And uh, I have another question. Uh, how, how do you think uh, for modern architecture, should people know more than just software development like DevOps or artificial intelligence because it becomes modern? Well, the, the question is if uh, we should study this new stuff. I think so, yes. I'm personally studying everything of that. Yes, but not because they are new, <laughs> because they are interesting and you have to, you have to deal with them. For, for instance, I'm now in, in a machine learning project, a um, uh, well, a project very based on computer vision, machine learning. I no need to know what's going inside component. Anyway, they are still component for me. For me, the focus is to organize the system and to make the system work. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. For now, I will stop asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> now it's my turn. <laughs> Hi. Oops. Sorry. Again, no? No, the camera. no sorry. Uh, my role is more into the uh, product owner side, but uh, I have a question on because sometimes we always hear that architectures are the one that gives the solution and have the answers and so on. At least that's what, I, what I've been hearing. But at the same time, we have the development teams that are currently working on the product itself. So how it's supposed to be the communication between architects and devs? Because uh, depending on, on the people that you've been working on, you always see that they have their vision and that's it. But others can, can be more inclusive and communicative. So what's your point of view about that? May I try to answer? To, to answer? Um, I don't know if I, uh, if I can answer your question because it's quite complex and, and a huge topic, but uh, I, I want to say just one, one point that can may help, which is that we, as architects, are not simply engineers receiving requirements. 
we are negotiating the requirement. That implies that we are translating technical requirements to mm, functional or non-functional requirements in, in a language a product owner can understand. And it's an important part of our job, I think. I don't know if they agree or if Yeah, but I, I wasn't focusing on my role exactly. I was focusing, for example, on my team uh, that they are working uh, currently on the solutions that are being implemented, in this case on VP as well. So I was wondering how should, I mean, how it should be the, the communication and relationship between the developers and the architects, not the product. Okay, uh, I think the developers have the vision only of what they are developing, okay? Or maybe in the product, no, not in the module, but in, in the product they are responsible of. But the architect must have the vision of, uh, more uh, big vision of what is going on on the company, okay? And uh, for the day to day, the developer should work with the architect on the, the, the tech definition or whatever, and the architect and the product owner should talk in the future of the products and how to connect products with other products and things like that, okay? But usually the developers only have the vision of what they are doing and don't care about how to connect things or things like that. That's my, my point. Okay. Yeah, kind of kind of agree, but the second part is, well, you're going to hate me for this, but it depends. It really depends. It depends on the maturity of the team. It depends on, on, on the maturity of the lead developer. It depends on the context of your company. Like, we have, a, we have a, a, an annoying role in our company because there's so many of us where we try to rein in technology. Just a bit of history because it makes sense. Uh, like four years ago, Vent Privé, the French company, uh, was a full Microsoft company. So it was .NET on Windows Server with SQL Server, and that's it. And no playing outside of these technologies. Like if you mentioned anything else, you would get shot. If you look at this now, this isn't a joke, right? All these technologies and all these stacks, they are actually in production today. So we went from one end and completely to the other one, right? But completely to the other If some of you might, especially those who do architecture, if you look at this, you should be saying this looks like a goddamn nightmare. Because there's multiple coding languages, multiple storage stacks, multiple deployment stacks, everything on one thing, and I just told you that's in production in our company. It's not multiple companies, it's one company, right? So we went too far. Like We opened up the doors to everything, we have, we have everything in production, everything. So now our job is trying to make sense of it because how do you encourage uh, people sharing stuff if, because you, you know developers, right? And you do know that someone is going to help hate Go and someone is going to hate Node. And maybe the guy who hates Go hates Node and the guy who hates Node hates Go. So they are going to yell at each other all day and they're going to have these religious discussions that never end, right? This is not productive. And if I want to have people grow and I want to change teams, if they want to switch subjects, and I want to give them opportunities inside the company, it helps if they actually speak the same language. So we need to not go monoculture again, but maybe not do everything under the sun and come somewhere in the middle. So we are the gatekeepers. Architects are trying to make sense of this. Like we all have in charge like five or six products uh, and we talk to five or six specific teams and we try to rein them in and make sure that at least these teams have the same language and the same stack. And it's not easy once you go from there, right? It's not easy. Um, this is one job that we do at the company because we had a maturity problem at some point. I know that a couple of teams in the company, I, we don't coach them at all technology-wise because they are experts in their stacks. They know what they need to do. They showed us their first architecture saying, is this a good idea? And we didn't, we didn't say, yes, this is good, and put a check. We said, this looks good. Go for it, and you maintain it, and you do it. So it depends. There's no clear-cut answer for me. Okay, just uh, because uh, I was wondering and on how uh, we could encourage new developers to aspire an architect, well, if we don't give them some flexibility to show actual the work, let's say. I, I don't think any architect is ever going to shoot down a developer who proposes things. So that's never going to be, because again, we all came from there. And I started off saying I never wanted to be an architect to start with, it just happens. 
And for you, how how was the how did how, how the switch happen? Because uh, it wasn't organically, or did you uh, so receive mentoring, or or what? No, I kind of had to learn. Hard. I was one of the guys who went to Google and did what does an architect actually do? Because this is what ha happened. I. I've been with uh, with VP for 13 years, so I've been there for quite a while. I've seen it with a 15 people team go to from from the tech part to the 1,000 that we are today. So I've seen all shapes and colors in this sense. Um, and I and I went I went from a standard developer with three years experience up till technologically technological expert on guess what Microsoft because that's what we had back then. Uh, to this changing environment where all of a sudden you had to learn and teach people a lot of new things where I started doing flexibility and much more coaching and much more vision and then well, you came into the Privada came into the picture and then uh, the other companies we bought got in the picture and all of a sudden I was doing way more how do we couple systems together and helping people get to where they were and doing way less in, in, in production so it it wasn't like a big promotion or anything it just one day someone said, you, you are an architect. I said, I, architects, I, I don't like architects, but that's what you're doing today. I said, okay. So it was really gradual, really, really gradual. So basically makes sense, just one last question, basically makes sense that for people that aspires to be an architect has to be very much acquainted of the technology that is working on the company right now because it's easier to, to make decisions of something that you already know and have a very good, not, coming from ex an external company and doing the jump from development to, to architect, or or does it work, or I don't know. Does it make sense, the question? That's yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think I understand what you're getting at. But because my path went through expertise in technology and then I switched over. Um, but I think that's only one path, and it's not the fact that I was an expert in my, in my stack that made me become an architect, it was the curiosity to look outside and to see what happened outside and take a step back. Like, for me, software architecture going up to enterprise architecture is a matter of Russian dolls. The principles you apply are always the same. It's always the same. Look at components that fit together and make sure that they don't pollute each other and connect systems together. So this works on the base software level when you're doing one single application, but it works on the bigger scale as well. It's always a matter of taking one step back. Thank you. Uh, I am trying to add in something if it's possible to what uh, you said, and I totally agree. Uh, uh, my experience as well is based upon basically cu curiosity. <laughs> so you start um, looking at other technologies and you start checking the stuff that, I mean, for me, uh, arch software architecture is, a, is about metaphors and checking other technologies communicates other metaphors. So you, you start thinking about them and someone in the company will will well will uh, take into account the fact that you are starting to think architecturally <laughs> and in that moment maybe you are proposed to be a software architect but uh, it starts uh, with uh, the cu curiosity in my experience yeah is 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 right it is so you start with one tech stack and try to introduce new things to uh, try to change things to do the, the the stuff in better way to learn new things and at some point you are an architect you are working as an architect uh, um, maybe with the, the role of developer but you are acting uh, as an architect and at some point I say hey I'm an architect they say okay <laughs> that was more or less my my experience. Mm, there's a concept. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a programmer and there's something I always go first when I have something before me and it's the release history. I'd like to know what have you seen with the concept of architect during your professional career? When, when did you start hearing about architecture and what, what was that? And how has it evolved? Because I think this is important. This is a concept that lets us understand what's actually an architect. No? So it's, a, it's an interesting question because I think the answer changed a lot in the, in the last 10 years. 
because the way we do things changed, not because the technology changed, actually. Um, like agile and products and short development cycles and more autonomy and more respect and so on. Like if you look back, um, if you look back not even that far ago, 10 years is not that far away, uh, we were all doing V cycles developments, right? The plan was set at the start and we start working and six months later we deliver something. And you can only do this if you have a specific map. So back then, and I think that's part of why I hated architects so much, because you had zero flexibility and zero choice in the matter. Like, there's a map, this is the technology you're going to use, and this is what you're going to do, now do it. And you just code, right? Which is fine, start, it gets boring very quickly. Um, today, when you want to release something and you want to push something into production every week or every two weeks, uh, the team needs to be completely autonomous, right? And it needs to be able to make snap decisions. You need to be able to change things very quickly. So the role of an architect becomes way less of a, of a dis decision-making role and, and a future-proofing role or anything like that. And it's more of a, it, it gets more of a, um, of a mentoring, making sure that you're going to the right direction, and more of a helper role, and way less of a deciding role. That's at least the way I'm seeing things today. Um, I'm, I think uh, it's, been, it's been a few years since I met an architect that still works in ivory tower again and just pun punches plans down. Today you're here to help as an architect. You're not here to make massive decisions. Um, I'm not going to lie, it still happens when sometimes you need to slam the table and say, okay, this is enough and we need to move forward, but that's more of an experience point of view and not of a role point of view. It's been, you've been there for 13 years and you, you've, you've worked on things for a while, so you actually know how things work. And and it's not your role that is punching the table, it's the person you are and the experience you have with the company. And it's common sense. It's not saying, I'm the architect, I decide. That's not the point. It's Thomas, I've been here for a while and I think we're making a mistake. Two very different things. Two very different things. I don't know, does it answer your question? Yeah? yeah. In, in my experience, I have been working for 25 years more or less. When I started as a programmer, things were totally different, nobody the, the role of an architect didn't exist. I became a programmer, analyst programmer, then analyst, but the job I was doing the, then is more or less the same job I'm doing now with another technology, uh, another paradigms, but the job is more or less the same. So I think you, uh, you are not an architect because you have the role. You are an architect because the job you, you do to try to uh, I don't know, connect things, learn new things, introduce uh, new technologies, learn, learn, and learn. And the most important, forget things that were true some years ago and they are not true anymore, things like that. This is the, the most difficult. Not, not learn new things, but forget old things. And try to um, uh, re renovate anytime. Okay? But about uh, software architecture, I've been hearing for seven, eight years, more or less. Before that, nobody knew about software architecture or what is this. Maybe, maybe Microsoft TechNet <laughs> is quite old. I mean, I think the culture lot of, of software architects. architecture... A lot of architects at Microsoft, a lot of them. So I, was, I wanted to go to this point, and once a chief architect of a, an architecture department where I was working said, okay, what's architecture? Because there was another department and they were stepping feet. So he said, architecture is not business. All you think not business is architecture when you code from business, that's architecture, okay? That's a concept. <laughs> I see you don't agree. Um, so this and the aspirations you have to learn. For me, a programmer and an architect are people who have to create value for the client. OK? Maybe one doesn't need to know much about the business, and the other one needs to know a lot about business. But it's not about learning things, because they all have to learn things if they want to create value. And the evolution, do, do you think you have to aspire to be an architect? You have to aspire to be a, if you are tier one ar architect or developer, you have to aspire to be a tier two, a tier three, and if you think you're able, tier four, not everyone can. Okay, but 
is, as, is an evolution up going from developing to architecturing? Well, uh, uh, yeah. I, I, in the first time, I said that to me, uh, to be an architect is not a military degree. So um, it's, it's about, I repeat myself, it's about architectural thinking. It's a way of thinking, a thing that we normally share a little bit. And it's about me software metaphors. I mean, stuff that we can communicate in a metaphor, for example. Well, one example which is pretty technical, and um, I think every, everybody here knows the Docker, the Docker as a tool. Well, I think that the architect of Docker had a very clear metaphor in, my, in, his, my, in his or her mind. Because it's very clear the metaphor, and if when you use Docker, you 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 understand the metaphor before understanding the commands, and so this is one. The, uh, I mean, it's not tool based; it's about logical thinking about metaphors. For me, it's a, and if you have of if I had to aspire to something, it would be architectural way of thinking. It won't be uh, an architectural vacant in some company. So um, we, David and I, we are on the same hierarchy level as all the developers in the company, right? So there's no tier or level structure. It's a different role. It's just something that's needed right now, right? In the, honestly, in, in the best of world, you wouldn't need us, because everyone would have the same degree of knowledge and the same vision on everything. It's just all the architects you have right now are people who've been here for a while and have a larger vision and are able to take a step back. So it's more of a question of experience. It's not a question of level or, or anything. I mean, like David said, and we both pretty much said the same thing. We didn't, it's not that we wanted to become architects. We just landed there at some point because it was needed at the time. So. To answer your question short, no, for me it's not a, it's not a level thing and it's not a stride. Like David started off very provocatively saying, why do you want to become an architect, right? He, he started off with this. So we both have a pretty much vision. Is it's a, it's a job that needs doing. Now is it better than development? No, the most important, the most important person in a tech company is the developer. Like it's, if you don't realize this yet, then you have to understand what you're doing. The most important part is the developer. It's not the architects, not the CTO, it's, it's the dev. And that's not just, political garbage, it's true, it's true. And we are on the same level as the developers, right? I have the same manager as the developers I work with. So, flat zone. In fact, the difference is if you like really coding, then you, you do, don't want to be an architect. We code, we do some proof of concept, sometimes libraries or sometimes whatever, but our main role is not to program it's not things. This is what the developers do. Okay, the, the, the architects have different vision. Uh, for example, in my tribe, uh, I have five products, each with different technology. One is Java, the other is Node.js, the other is uh, Go, the other is C Sharp. And I, it's impossible, I, I cannot uh, know all the, these technologies to help them. But my vision is, uh, I. I I can help them not in the coding part, but in uh, another thing like uh, adopting uh, pipelines, uh, guidelines, uh, testing, because it's the same in uh, more or less all the languages, okay? Uh, but if you, what you really like is coding, is programming, then you don't want to be an architect. <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't say you don't want to yeah. be an architect, just yeah. be aware that you're going to do way less of it yeah. than you used to. Yeah, it's about the question. I, I just want to make a short disclosure, or how to say, reveal some information about the levels. Actually, they exist, but uh, they exist in some companies, not here. I agree with everything was said before, but in other company, IPAM, for instance, it is a fifth level. So architect is level five. So level one, junior, level two, developer, level three, senior developer, level four, team lead or tech lead. Basically, if you tech lead, level four, then you can go to level five architecture, which is more technical stuff. 
And uh, if you team lead, you can go to delivery management, also level five, but more soft skills uh, direction. And when you level five, you're architect, you, sh you should be architect in one tech stack to, for sure. For instance, for backend, you might be architect in Amazon Web Services, but then you, you might proceed to another tech stacks and then you will, how to say, improve as an architect to other levels with multiple tech stacks. So they exist, but in some companies, but mainly it's about your attitude, yes. So uh, I have a multiple part questions. Uh, question. The first one is, do you think a development background is required to be an architect? Or if you're just good at thinking abstract contexts, co concepts and analyze abstract subjects, you're good at job by definition? I'm actually scared of the second part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to name names. <laughs> so yes, for me, it's completely necessary to have a background in development to actually be an architect. Yes. That's Why is that? Here. I agree. Why? And the same for me. For me, it's uh, required n not only to be a programmer, is to be a good programmer, OK? To know how to apply uh, good practices, how to uh, create an an application from scratch, uh, well, with or without uh, frameworks, and so is uh, you, you need that background because uh, it's different level, but the, the the abstraction are there, are the same. So I, I think I know where you're getting with this. You don't need to be a, an expert when you are an architect. So it's it's good because you're talking with tech people. And we all know tech people only respect other tech people. That's just the reality of things. Uh, now, when you're an architect, and when you're stuck in, when you talk, especially on my level, when I'm doing like enterprise architecture, I'm doing a lot of very high-level stuff. And technically, being an expert on .NET doesn't matter anymore. It really doesn't matter because I'm completely relying on the ex excellent devs that we have to actually do the tech uh, analysis and the jobs, right? Because they are the they are the ones carrying the architecture that you're proning, right? I don't need to be this anymore. However, to actually understand and do my job correctly, I need to know how software works. This is very important. And you can't no understand how software works if you haven't done development to an extended degree. Right? You can understand how this application works. Yes, this, this works. How software works is very different to understanding how this software works. Does, does it make yes, sense? Yes, yes, makes sense. Yeah. But uh, how do you make sure you, as you spend a lot of time working on abstract subjects, talking to people, uh, analyzing systems, that you keep your hands on the, you, you stay on the ground basically? You, do you think you, for example, some, some uh, architects believe they have to reserve some time to code? Do you think it's important? Yes, and we don't do it enough. It's the sh long and short of it, right? The, in the perfect world, architects would have the time to participate in sprints on the teams they work with. Right? That was the vision that we talked about when we started working on architecture. Like, again, our company is split up. We all have like six, <coughs> six teams that we coach, lead, and so on. And the idea at the start was every month or so, we participate in a sprint. We commit code, and we push code into production. That was the pitch. Now I'm down to a time where I see my team one day out of five because sometimes I have to travel, and sometimes I have to work on other things. So on a time perspective, and realistically, going this low is not feasible uh, without impacting the team that you are contributing to. Because I know that if I was going to contribute to a team today, I would slow them down, and I would kill their velocity. And that's not the point, right? Just to fill my ego, that doesn't make sense. So how do you fix this? Personally, I cheat. I have a couple of tools that are still in production that, that I maintain under the radar which is bad because I'm a massive bottleneck. Uh, but I, need, I still need my hands in production somehow and keep them dirty. Uh, and yes, like everyone else, I look at stuff in the weekend and I do play around with sandboxes and things like this. Like my best friend today is our lead SRE because he's playing around with new things and then he pushes them here. Can you, pl can you try Rancher 2? Well, Cube, we want to move over there. Yeah, gimme, gimme, gimme. And then you start playing around with it because it's your job as an architect to make sure that everything works. 
but it's more of an excuse to actually put your hands in there and look at how it runs, because I can't have the luxury of slowing my teams down when I commit to them. So it's a lot of personal work and it's a lot of scheduling. It's really difficult. So, so basically, if you want to be an architect and you want to stay technically relevant, you what? You have to spend your weekends coding. Right now, yes, but that's more of a of an ecosystem thing, and not a, a. It's not going to be like this in every company. Just a bit of background. We bought Vent Privé France bought four companies, and we are in the process of merging everything together. Like, um, if you've done this already in tech, that's one of the hardest things you will ever do. So yes, today we don't have the time to do this properly, and we take the hit. Right? Someone needs to take the hit, so we take the hit. In a normal, well, in a normal company, it makes <laughs> makes ma makes me sound all high and mighty. That's not the point. Um, when you schedule your work properly, and it's not so insane as what we are doing right now, you should be able to carve out time to do this on company time. Thank you. Uh I, I would like to spend a few more words on this because my my case is a little bit different from from there. I think, in the sense that I'm a little bit tech oriented, and uh, mm, even because of my personal interests, I'm quite interested, in, for example, in uh, the design of statically uh, typed languages. So I, I touch and on daily basis also the, syst the system operations. So, and uh, mm, but I, w I w would. I wanted to uh, answer your question about why an architect should be a technician as well. And uh, to me, it's because, and I w want to use the words of Martin Fowler here, uh, an architect uh, harvest, harvest from experience with developers and generalize. So you need to know the technical details, I think. I'm talking about if we spend the, the weekend coding or not. I do, but because I like. And But what I do in the weekends is not the same what I'm trying to study here. But when I'm here, I try to uh, book some meetings with me myself to study new technologies. I cheat. <laughs> okay, so, but those technologies are oriented to something that we could use in the company. And what I do in my weekends usually is only for fun. I have a question. Um, imagine that you are in an architecture meeting of a, a new project, new product. You are in a project developing a new product, and you are in a, an architect meeting. And which topics? What you talking about, and which people should be involved there? <laughs> it's the real life. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> so that depends on how. F is it the first meeting? Is it the first time we're talking? Is it like the kickoff? No, or something in the middle of the. In the middle. So yes. we already know how the project is going to connect to everything else. Mm, it's supposed, okay. but so maybe not. The question, uh, why am I asking, asking the question is because you're going to have, well, at least the way we work is we have multiple instances where we interact with the project team when we are needed, like to give guidelines. The first question you're asking, there's zero technology involved, is this product we're developing, does it fit into an existing eco ecosystem and does it connect to something else? If yes, how and what does it contribute and what uh, where does it start and where does it stop? Pretty much, so it's more high-level stuff. Like, um, what do you get? In, what do you, what's your input? What's your output? What do you do inside? You start drawing a few boxes, but there's no tech involved. We are not talking about any technical constraints. It's more high-level stuff of how the flow is actually going to work. So everyone agrees on this. And by the way, not everyone always agrees on this on the first one. So it mm -hmm. can actually take time to say no. It starts there and it ends there. The frontiers are often a bit, a bit blurry. Once you've done this, you can start talking of how you're going to do it. So if you're talking about a, pro a product, a real product which is autonomous, which has a lead developer, a lead PO, um, the architect uh, should almost not be involved. Like what he should do is show up and say, by the way, um, these are your constraints. And constraints are like you can, in the worst case, you can choose between all these technologies. 
the best case, please don't use these technologies because a couple of them we don't want to support. And I'm here if you need me, but it's, I'm here if you need me, right? The architecture should be proposed and drafted by the lead developer. The architects need to look at it to make sure that he's not gone crazy, but it's not the architect who's driving the, this discussion. Eh? It's a product discussion. The product is owned by the product, owned by the lead developer, so you're just there to suggest things. Now, the, arch, the, the lead developer is going to do architecture, and he's going to do real software architecture, coming up with components, what kind of stack he's going to use, probably do a design doc if he has to. So this is things we can help him with as architects because we've done this for a while, so we can show him, but he's the one who's going to do it. We are there to help, control, but not push things down the throats of lead devs. Yeah, but <laughs> I think that is um, the, the other side. So I think that the architect should push the other people to, to solve the problems or to, um, to investigate what is, the, what, what, what is the problem and, and then what is the constraint and ask to you. Because sometimes um, each, each team works independently and they need uh, an architect to control them. Yeah, so, so, the when, so when you say control, them. what part? What part does he need to control? The technological part, the way they are doing things inside of the products, or the way it interacts with the rest of the world? The way they interact. This I completely agree with you. They don't know how to join the yep. each part. Okay, but this, this, this I agree with you. Like um, the first meeting when you're talking about flows and how it all interacts, yes, the architect needs to be there because he's technically the one who is going to spot you missed something or you need to talk to these people. This, this I agree with you. But once we're going into the product itself and we're talking about design of the application and so on, the architect again, in my mind, is there to control, not to push things. Like he has an agenda, of course. We all have, we all evil masterminds and we have agendas. But it's more about technology and things we want to constrain rather than enforce, right? At the end of the day, my goal is like I, when I was a developer, I want to work the least amount possible. To be able to work the least amount possible, I need other people to do my job. But first in line are the lead developers. Lead developers need to learn my job so I don't have to do it anymore and they can do it for me. Mm -hmm. So empower them, make them work, and focus on the thing where you can get the most value, which is uh, talk to the other teams and make sure that it actually interacts with the rest of the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for me, the, the architect should not be the police for the team. <laughs> should be uh, people who help the team. If, if the team asks help, of course, the, the architect can help. How, and it depends on the maturity of the team, of course. If it's a very junior team, the architect should be more involved to help them to take the... I, I would say right decisions, but if it's uh, a mature team, it's better to uh, ask them if if they need help, better than impose uh, your way of uh, doing things. Yeah. Okay, because uh, you have to trust in in your developers. If not, uh, then they won't trust you too and. <laughs> It will be, uh, this is a mistake, okay? For, for me, you don't have to be the, the police of the team. You have to be the, the mentor, the uh, person who helps them to, and if they ask for help, of course, we, I try to, to do my best. Uh, but I don't think I should impose my ideas in front of, of them because they know the reality of the product. I, I can, uh, as Thomas say, constrain some things and say, don't do this because, uh, th don't use MySQL because we prefer to use Postgres because of this, of this, of this. Okay, but th the tool is for the same. But if they want to uh, do synchronous versus asynchronous, wh whatever, it's better to let them to take their own decisions. Yeah. I, um, sorry, I think and I think now that uh, maybe maybe enforcing those qualities that you mentioned is different from the concept of, of imposition. So you can enforce something without imposing. 
and uh, and based on my experience at Happy Hub with uh, with uh, um, liquid or fluid teams and and uh, different projects and so on, I think I I come back to the concept of focusing in order to um, well to to check if there are, there are problems in every team. You know, I need to to do this without imposing, but questioning everything. It's not imposing; it's questioning, and uh, and going to the truth. If if there's a problem or not, and if it, there's a problem, that's where I can help. Maybe yeah, you are not a police, of course, but <laughs> sometimes um, I think that uh, dev leads or developers they don't know how to solve something, and they make up uh, a solution that is not a weak solution. And it's not um, the may, maybe the the one that architect should propose. That but as you say, um, you have to question to to make them think which is the solution. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. I, I I think if not is I mean architecture is failing at some point. <laughs> It's just that uh, it was mentioned that architects are the police and everything. And <clears throat> what I don't hear is mentioning that, well, as usually architects come from the tech side, and uh, they are usually in a position to talk with the business and to actually protect the team from some business decisions, you know, because usually in software, it's always uh, the push because who pays for the development is the business. So they want something fast. And uh, doing this, if you let them do it, they do it uh, taking a lot of shortcuts. What in architecture is called, uh, well, technical depth that can exist on various levels. No, So there is uh, uh, some decisions that architects actually have to protect the team from these decisions. And they have a leverage sometimes because you are a senior developer and you have the same idea. But when you are architect, they listen to you. <laughs> so I think uh, it's better to see this position as, uh, well, to help everybody, to help some people from shooting themselves in the foot and then, you know, do, do some bad things with the dev team. And for dev team also to be a bit happier to have some more time on doing some development. So it's, I think it's not like fighting over tech decisions, but... Uh, helping the dev team have more time to make better tech decisions. <laughs> OK? I, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, it's, it's not a really question. Uh, to explain to my family and to every people, I saw um, architecture. I'm an architect to the future. Uh, like uh, Gaudi, it's an, a cool architect for the Sagrada Fag Emilia. Um, it's fine, you can do everything. Uh, you can do everything when you are an architect. You can think about many people, many things. Um, you know uh, many, uh, many languages. Uh, but the idea of uh, architecture for me, uh, it's really to find the best solution for your company. Um, and I, like I told to my students, you need to know um, uh, many language, but you need to understand the people. And the people that they are uh, very, you need to be open-minded. So soft skill is very important, but you need to open-minded to understand every uh, complex uh, idea because uh, women and men are different. They are thinking differently. Uh, uh, and it's that many, the idea of architecture is the future. And that's, that's it. I think. Do you think it's my vision in clear or yes. do you have another point? No, no, for sure. I uh, agree. mostly agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>